Thank you for participating in the Courageous Conversation. This event is hosted by the Black History Committee. Today, the topic of discussion is the legacy of Black excellence and achievement. Views expressed by individuals on this live stream do not necessarily reflect those of Johnston Community College. Welcome panelists and those of you at home to the Courageous Conversation discussion panel, where we will have a courageous conversation about legacy of black excellence and achievement. One thing I would like to clarify, so many narratives involving black history always seem to come back to black pain and slavery. That is not what this panel is about. That is not what we're about. We're here to celebrate black excellence and positively uplift ourselves. This is a discussion about paving the road for opportunity and prosperity and to discuss the responsibility we have as black professionals, educators, students, and leaders to nurture and inspire black excellence and achievement. My name is William Dean and I will be your moderator this evening. We have five panelists for our discussion today. If you would please introduce yourselves with your professional title, with your name, your professional title, where you're originally from and how long you've been a part of the local community, beginning with Mr. Carlin Fry. Uh, good evening. Thank you, William. I'm Harlan Fry. I'm in, uh, the Associate Vice President of Human Resources at Johnson Community College. I'm originally from Greensboro, North Carolina, and I um, have been in the community for three years or at JCC, and I've lived in several places across the country, uh, but I've been in the area, uh, JCC area, for three years. Hey, Don. Yourself, Don. So I said that whole thing. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Dawn Dixon. I'm the Associate Vice President of University Studies and Educational Technologies at Johnston Community College. I'm originally from Hamden, Connecticut, and I've been in Johnston County and at JCC for 15 and a half years. Hello, everybody. How you doing? I'm glad that you are here with us this evening. Uh, my name is Joseph Von Jones. I'm a senior success advisor at the college, originally from uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, but however, I represent and was raised uh, in Cresswell, North Carolina, small town uh, on the Outer Banks. Uh, I have been at Johnson Community College for 10 years. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyrell uh, Robertson. Uh, first off, I want to thank the Black History Month Committee for allowing me to be a part of this panel today uh, with such great panelists. And um, I am the BSA president, the Black Student Alliance president here at Johnson Community College, as well as a first year uh, radiography student. Um, originally, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, um, but I believe I was born and raised, or raised um, per se in Johnson County, and I've been in, uh, part of the community for about eight or nine years. Good evening, everybody. My name is Stacy Sewell. Um, I am the Director of Admissions and Recruitment at South Carolina State in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I am from Selma, North Carolina, born and raised, and I lived in the Johnston County area for 39 years. Uh, currently living in Orangeburg, South Carolina, but I am born and raised product of Johnston County. Thank you, panelists. Once again, welcome tonight. We have some pre-crafted questions for you. Um, the way this will work today, the idea is to present the question, but we would really like um, honest and, um, and, and candid responses um, and to just uh, have you know an intellectual discourse, a conversation. We wanna keep this going as a conversation. So I'll present the question to you and then um, just, uh, you know, we'll try to, we'll, we'll try to branch off into our other questions um, throughout the panel, okay? Um, first question 
I want to direct um, to uh, Harlan and um, others can, um, can you know, come right after him. There's no particular order, but um, I want to start with Harlan with this first question. How do you personally define Black legacy? Thank you for the question, William. I guess I would start out by saying that um, in with Black legacy, I first look at the definition of what legacy is. And to me, that is looking at what leaders we had in the past, particularly Black leaders, those that are present, and how you uh, take things from what you've seen in the past, how you um, implement those things or continue the legacy that others have done in the past, and then what do you plan to leave in the future for those that, uh, that, that come behind you? And so I was fortunate to uh, be raised uh, in a family, a very loving family, and my parents were very active uh, in, in, the, in the Greensboro area as well as the state. So one of the first things that, um, that particularly my mother and my father but wanted to make sure of was that they knew I was black, or that I knew I was black, rather, not that they knew. So I went to a predominantly white uh, elementary school, but in sixth grade, uh, when we had to draw ourselves, my mother was so proud that I um, took a coloring uh, crayon and colored myself black. So from that perspective, it, it set the foundation to make sure that I understood what leaders in the past have helped them to succeed and how they planned on raising me as a as a son. So uh, I was fortunate enough to deal or be involved with a lot of different uh, activities that my father and my mother both were the first to be a part of. And so uh, I, you know, as a child, I learned early, you know, what to do and how to present myself in. Uh, in the environments and the cultures that uh, I was involved in. So, you know, the, the, the whole Black legacy thing is what is the history that others, Black leaders in the past have, have left for us to continue? You know, whether that's Martin Luther King, whether, you know, regardless of who, it, whether it's Muhammad Ali, those, but I had the family that to watch and see every day. And I think I was probably about seven or eight before I realized that my both my parents were uh, looked at as being leaders in the community, even though at the time I wasn't as aware of it until I got older and realized that the things that they did in the past were leaving legacies, not only for myself, but for friends of mine that I grew up with. So I'll stop there and let others speak to, to the question as well. Um, what I think of legacy, I think of it as something that you leave behind for the next generation that could impact them. Um, I know for me personally, um, my parents have left me a legacy just by the principles and teachings that they have just that I, they have installed in me as I was growing up. And I'm able to use that not only in my daily life, but as when I have children, I'll be able to use it um, and teach it to them as well. Um, so I think of it as something that is, you know, passed on to the next generation. And it doesn't have to be something like a business. It could be something as your grandmother's cookbook or um, a business plan that your father may have had and he may not have enough funds to, to maybe start that business. But maybe now you um, living in, you know, 2021 in the 20th century, you may have those funds to start that business. So I just think of it as something that um, someone has passed on to the next generation that can benefit them in their lives and in the future as well. So when I think about legacy, I think about the meme comes to mind of thinking about black legacy. Um, so it's, it says that, uh, you know, the meme that we've all seen where 
Uh, it says Rosa set so Martin could march, so Obama could run. Uh, but it also means that there's so many more people uh, within the black community that we haven't heard of who has provided opportunity through their sacrifice for those of us who are able to do and, and have right now in this uh, present day and time. Um, so to me, it means taking that uh, responsibility upon ourselves to provide an opportunity for those who look like us as they move forward throughout the future. So one of the things that I've always said is that you have to be able to see yourself in something. So if we are able to provide an example for uh, our next generation that they too can be because we are, then that's legacy. It also reminds me of a poem uh, called The Bridge Builder by William Allen Drumgale, which says, uh, an old man going along highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossing the twilight dim, the sullen stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your time with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never uh, again will pass this way. You cross this chasm deep and wide. Why build you this bridge of even tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend in the path I have come, he said, that followeth after me today, a youth whose feet must pass his way. This chasm that has been as naught to me, to that fair haired youth, may a pitfall be. Good friend, I am building this bridge for him because he too must cross in the twilight down. So that's the uh something that I've always said and something that I've always wanted to lead my life as an example, use my life as an example for those who may be watching me that I'm not sure that's watching, always wanting to make sure that I'm providing opportunity for them by speaking, standing for something and, and uh, speaking truth. Uh, because if we don't tell the truth, if we don't express ourselves freely, then no one's going to really know. Uh, so that's what legacy is to me. Um, to me, Black legacy, when I think of what is Black legacy and how I define it, I think of one phrase that predates um, African-Americans' existence in the United States and one that dates back to the 1890s. The first is the concept of Ubuntu. It is a Zulu phrase that basically means I am because you are. Um, so I am because of my ancestors. I am because of my mother and my father grandparents and ancestors that I cannot name. Um, and so I am their legacy and therefore I will leave a legacy so someone else can be because I am. Um, the second one is a um, the motto of the uh, National Association of Federated Women's Clubs that was founded in the 1890s. It was a, a coalition of over 3000 clubs um, of black women across the United States that were formed for um, for civic and, and community engagement. And right there in Johnston County, um, there are two, um, I'm not sure if they're still in existence, one in Selma, North Carolina, the Omelie's Women's Club um, and the Progressive Women's Club uh, in Smithfield. Um, and their motto, the national motto is lifting as we climb. And so that was all about, you know, as black people um, gained any sort of upward mobility um, post emancipation, the concept was to look back and lift others as you climb. Um, so that is what I believe um, black legacy to be. I love that, Stacey. And I, I think for those of us who work in education, um, that that definitely resonates with us. And I, you know, I know these people. I, I am so proud of Tyrell for starting um, the Black Student Union because I think at the core, that's what we're trying to do is continue to provide opportunities, especially because of those who provided opportunities to us. So I am, you know, the product of a single mother with five kids who, you know, told me that you are um, proud and beautiful, and confident and empowered. I'm, I'm the product of a grandmother who, you know, did so much to create a very um, uh, um, powerful real estate business, you know, um, in Connecticut. 
And so I think that we are um, people who every day try to create legacy in what we do and the work we do and how we interact with others. Uh, before we jump to our next question, I just want to ask, um, who do we consider our Black leaders? It's not one of the official questions. Who do, who do we consider our Black leaders? What comes to mind? Because I was thinking, I keep hearing like Black leaders. Who do we consider? I know personally for me, it's probably people you you've never heard of its community leaders it's it's those who do the um the work at this level to try to um connect and communicate and provide opportunities um for others um, i just had a great conversation with one the other day trying to share information um to students of color about scholarship opportunities so um i i look a lot to to my community folks um, who I feel um, are leaders and who can open doors for for others. And I was going to say the same thing Dawn said. I think locally, uh, within your own home, uh, so like she spoke about her grandmother. My grandmother is uh, the most one of the most powerful uh, inspirations and people in my life. She passed away in two thousand and eight, but even into even today, I honor her in trying to make right decisions because of the sacrifices that she uh, uh, gave. She raised me, she adopted me, and um, she was single. And she did the best she could to make me feel like I was uh, in a normal situation. And so I don't mention her a lot because I get I get emotional when I think about her, even at 43, because I reflect on all the times that she um, provided for me. So uh, that's uh, one of my leaders. So if you're listening, if you're a parent, you have to be strong and stern and provide that direction for your kids in the house before they have uh, heroes out here in the streets that's going to be um, telling them to do the wrong thing. So I think that it starts at home and locally. And then when you can see yourself in your home and in your local leaders, then you can dream and be uh, someone on a, a larger scale or a larger platform. I would like to, um, uh, I'll, I'll say um, there's a, a former president of Shaw University and St. Augustine's um, University named um, Dr. Uh, Gaddis Falcon. And one of his favorite sayings was leadership is influence. And so if you are a person of influence and you have influence over people, you are a leader. Um, and so that could be everyone on this uh, on this panel, um, parents, teachers, um, you know, not just people of quote unquote elevated rank, such as politicians or people with national or regional platforms. Um, leadership is anyone who has influence over a group of people. And so it 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 matters what you do with that influence. So, so I was going to add to the conversation that you know, I, my parents obviously to me or have been leaders not only for me but again for the community and the state and and actually the nation. And so, one of the things or two of the things, one, my my mother always talks about that we have to serve, and so I try to make sure that I serve the community in a way that leaves a legacy since we were talking about legacy. And then secondly, my father always talks about that you have to matter. And what that means to me is that we all have a circle of influence as leaders that we can influence people in the community, in our, in our circle, whatever that circle is, and that you have to matter in order to be successful and, and to help leave your own legacy. All right, I want to um, just find if you could um, be the first to answer this question. Um, what's new about Black Legacy? Are there any contemporary considerations that 
have created unique opportunities or barriers for the black community. Did you say me, William? Josephine, sorry. Oh, Josephine. All right, so what's new about Black Legacy? Are there any contemporary considerations that have created unique opportunities or barriers for the Black community? Um, I think that within the last 12 years, uh, we've had the opportunity to see within, for on a national scale, uh, first Black president. Um, then we have the first Black female vice president, which now allows, if you could think about when you were little, when you were young, and I'll give you an example of when I was in the in uh, the first grade uh, in 1983. Um, Jesse Jackson and Ronald Reagan were in the presidential election, so we did mock um, vote in, inside a classroom. <clears throat> I voted for I voted for Ronald Reagan because I didn't believe that a white a black man could be the president, and I remember feeling defeated at that. I, I remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, I remember feeling defeated or that it was just natural because I've never seen it. But for eight years, little boys and little girls all over this country and all over this world saw a black man as the president. And they can finally now say, I too can be that. And now we have first black female vice president. Um, that opens up doors and opportunities for our, our women because our women have been traditionally marginalized for a long time. Um, and we can go way back and talk about pain, but we said we're not gonna talk about pain on this panel. But I will talk about the barriers that exist when it comes to us having those opportunities in our, and being able to visualize. And we have people who say things like, they only got that position because they're black. So what that does is create an immediate divide and then tell someone on that side who's saying it, are unwilling to speak up against it and say, no, they got it because they were qualified. It's, all, it's gonna to continue to be a barrier because we are still not represented at the C-suite level in a lot of organizations and, and places. So when decisions are made, those decisions are only made from a, one perspective. Um, so we need to bring more perspectives to the table because if you are only, if you really think that uh, people are only getting positions because they're uh, they're black. Then you're mistakenly wrong because I went to college and study and earned this right to apply for those positions. And the experience that I've gained over time puts me in the same room to be able to have that opportunity as anyone else. Um, so that's that's what I feel about our opportunities and the barriers that have that present themselves. I want to try to uh, create uh, a dialogue uh, between each of the panelists. Does anybody want to follow that up, please? I think that um, what's new in Black Legacy is, firstly, a freedom to define ourselves. Um, you know, particularly young people, and some days I consider myself in that group, and some days I don't, but particularly young people. Um, do not exist in the same boxes that we have in the past, what you can or can't do or what you should or shouldn't do um, as black people. Um, you know, there is a there is a freedom to define our own standards of what black is, what black does and what black look like looks like. Um, and that could have exponential opportunities for the future of black legacy. Um, also, opportunities, um, there's knowledge of how to build wealth. Um, you know, I think in previous generations, uh, African American families did not share financial matters. They kept those matters, you know, close to the chest. Uh, my parents are, are, are older, um, and so I didn't know what was going on financially with them. And so I've made some of the finance, same financial mistakes that they did. So um, I think that generations behind me have a greater knowledge of how to build generational wealth and what what you know what comes with that and what takes uh, what what it takes to do that. Some of the barriers um, that persist to 
um, building black legacy, uh, there are entrenched misconceptions of who black people are, what we do, um, that we're all monolithic, uh, meaning we, we all talk the same, consume the same music, literature, you know, we're just, we're just one type of people. Um, so that, that continues to be uh, an entrenched misconception. Um, and, and it, it's kind of proliferated worldwide. It's not, um, it's not exclusive to uh, the borders of the country. Um, and there is a, is still a, an entrenched resistance to black mobility um, as far as, and that goes back to us, you know, being perceived as, as being monolithic and all being the same. Um, there is, you know, an assumption that there are places where we shouldn't be or couldn't be or whatever. Um, or don't have the right to be. Um, and so that mobility, by mobility, I mean our physical mobility, um, us being able to freely move around uh, still, and then our you know, upward mobility financially, professionally, um, even socially, um, th there are still, still barriers in, in, in those ways. I'll make one comment about it, and that is that I think the the information that is available now, as quickly as it's available, is better than what it was, you know, when 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 our parents were growing up. And so, from that perspective, we get information quickly, and things that you didn't know for months or even years, now you know. And it, so, that at the same time, as a uh, as a positive thing, it also can be a barrier, uh, but things are much more open now than they were in the past. I agree with, yeah. with, with Harlan on that. I, I, the internet, I mean, social media, um, all of that exposure um, and awareness, whether it's good or bad, um, I think creates both opportunities and, and significant barriers. So, um, I mean, that's a whole, a whole nother story, but it has um, really opened people up, I think, more to um, who we are as African Americans and our experience and our culture, um, as well as depict us in certain ways, which just seem to perpetuate, you know, some um, people's stereotypes um, about us. So it, it, it is a interesting creature that we have to figure out how we're going to navigate that, how it's going to, um, its place in our, our world. But it, it really is, as Harlan was saying, the amount of information we can um, uh, gather very quickly, the, the, the narratives that are pushed out daily um, about us is, you know, can impact the legacies that we have because things can be um, explored um, easier than ever before. Let me add one more thing, because Don made me think of, of, of something related to that is that we are in the business of educating. And so because we're educating, you know, prior and in, in, in only in recent years has Black history been a part of the curriculum. And, and sometimes even now that's being a barrier in some counties and so forth. But I do know that in some counties they now are including uh, black history facts in the history uh, uh, curriculum and books that are being printed. Um, so people now know, and, and in fact, all cultures understand and know now that black Americans or, or, or blacks in general have contributed to what we all use and hear and see on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And by, before that, they didn't know. And, you know, just to piggyback off of that, um, I don't think any of that would be possible. Um, and I, I'm just shedding light on maybe a younger perspective, not to say that, you know, you guys are you're still beautiful and black, you know, but um, I, I don't think that that would be possible without the voice of the younger generation. Um, I think now um, us, my generation, we are not afraid to let others know how we are feeling. I mean, just look at what transpired last year. Um, 
just dealing in a time of really racial unrest in a pandemic. And, you know, you knew how you knew what was going on because of the voice, the Black Lives Matters movement, you know, the things that happened with George Floyd. And I think that's also what is changing in the Black legacy is the courage and the uprise that us young people have to let others know how we are feeling so that change can happen. You know, Martin Luther King, Sojourner the Truth, Rosa Parks, you know, they did that back in the, in the day. We are now the new Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, the Sojourner Truth. So while we are here, you know, it is important that we let others know the voice that we have. Um, and that's one thing too that also kickstarted with me being a student and starting a first black organization at the college, at Johnson Community College, um, because change has to start now. You know, we and it doesn't start unless somebody um, moves. So that's that's how I see it. Stacy, I want to uh, ask, uh, can you, uh, I just want to go back a little bit. Can you uh, give us an example of what you mean by freedom to define ourselves? Um, really to piggyback off of what Terrell said, um, you know, if you look at, uh, well, most people haven't been to the Black Lives Matter website and actually read uh what's on it um and so it is there, there are several points there not just about um the main the overarching is um to eliminate violence against black people by um by the by the state state sponsored violence um but also the definition of family so one of the points of black lives matter is the freedom to define what family means to black people um, and, and an inclusiveness of who Black people are. Um, if you look at the history of previous um, social justice movements in the Black community, um, they were not inclusive. Uh, you know, they were uh, patrilineal. They centered um, Black men's voices and Black women were on the periphery. They were workers in the movement, but they were not considered um, leaders at the time. We now look at the Fannie Lou Hamers and Dorothy Heights and and uh, Rosa Parks and, and so on and so forth and Ella Bakers uh, as leaders now, but in their own time, they were not considered leaders. Um, so previous, even, even you know, in the black power movements, um, uh, Kathleen Cleaver was just seen as Eldridge Cleaver's wife. <laughs> you know, um, when we're looking at contemporary movements um, and analyzing them, they are more inclusive. So being able to define what leadership means and what leadership looks like for ourselves, um, beauty standards. Uh, in, in my mother's day, um, I've worn some version of natural hair since 2003. Um, and in 2003, when I chopped my perm off, it was still controversial to wear our hair the way it springs from our scalp. Um, there's legislation to bar discrimination from how our hair grows from our scalp. Um, but we have uh, found the freedom to, to fight against that and to define what beauty looks like. And, and you know, big upwardly pointed hair is part of that. Um, you know, even black men with beards is, is, is rev long beards is revolutionary. Um, just being able to define what we think is beautiful and having the freedom and not even just the freedom, but having the wherewithal when there is not freedom um, to, to wear and adorn ourselves as we see fit and we do it anyway. Um, the freedom to define what love is um, amongst ourselves. The, uh, you know, I know we're not gonna dwell on pain, but I'm a, I'm a historical person. So I like to tie the, the history to the present. Uh, one of the first things um, freed people's did in 1865 was go look for their families that had been torn apart from them. So us defining what family is, what it means, um, you know, uh, we always talk about the campus mom and the campus auntie and, and our play cousins and, you know, our sisters and brothers and we have kids and they call our friends auntie and uncle. The freedom to, you know, define what family means and define what kinship means. 
Um, so that's what I mean by the freedom to define what basically define how we live and to to bust out of the box of of limitations that um, existing as black people in this country have have brought to us. Uh, you know, I, I believe the legacy of of Terrell's generation will be um, destroying that box and and being just being as free as possible to define oneself. All right, thank you. This next question, I would like for uh, Don to start off with. Um, what current circumstances or environmental factors do you believe may cause barriers that we as a community college may address? Um, I think there's always um, a access to the community college um, and access to higher education is, is certainly something that we can try to address by outreaching, by inviting, by having a welcoming environment um, for students. Um, I think that is important that we inform students so that they can make um, the best decisions possible. Um, I think that uh, students uh because you know at the community college currently you know we work with ninth graders you know all the way up to senior citizens and i see a need for us as a um community college to work more closely with our school partners our secondary school partners and helping students understand their possibilities um you know, I we have a new program and I was inquiring why we weren't having, we had one African-American student. I have other great programs. I have one African-American applicant. And I'm like, what is, what is going on? And um, a person on the school, the secondary school side was telling me, well, they're very scared of the program because it's a rigorous program and they don't know, you know, um, if there's going to be people there to support them. And so I, in my mind, I'm saying I need to show that actually there are, there's an African-American woman who's over the program. There's people of color who are faculty in the program. Um, so I think we, we need to do as much as we can to outreach um, to students at the secondary level who are making decisions that say that higher ed is not for me. Um, for um, they can't see themselves there. They don't want to go to places where people don't look like them. Um, and I think that that we need to make conscious choices about making sure that our um, faculty body um, is diverse, um, that they are um, informed uh, and sensitive to the, the needs of a diverse student body so that we can service you know all students. Um, and I think that um, that's our responsibility as educators and that that is a barrier that whether some students may articulate it privately, maybe, you know, not publicly, they may not even be aware that that is why they're making a choice to exit or not even um, come. Um, but when you start putting some of the pieces together and they start revealing tidbits, then, uh, you know, about their experience, then it is very clear, at least to me sometimes, that um, they did not see a place for themselves at, um, at, at the post-secondary level. Doesn't, I'm not saying specifically JCC, but sometimes it's just at the, at the um, higher ed level that they don't think that's for them. I want to piggyback off of that, um, off of what Ms. Nixon said. Um, first off, what I think of the college, a community college is, well, at JCC particularly, is a college for the community. Um, so you can have that, you know, by doing those outreach events and reaching out. Um, but, it, it, and, but really, I do believe that no matter what the college does, it can, nothing can happen unless we, um, the people, the ones that is affecting, step up. 
you know, not only is, you know, what Ms. Dixon was talking about is happening in, in uh, the secondary level, but even in the collegiate level, you know, in the radiography program that I'm in, I'm the only African-American male. You know, a lot of these programs, a lot of these classes, a lot of these things that I've participated on campus, I've been the only African-American male. Um, and it just started, and, and I didn't have that, you know, I didn't grow up to, to have that spirit of fear. Um, you know, I choose to walk by faith and I just carry that and I, and I maneuver through life. And that's what has gotten me to the place that I am now. And that's something else that also, you know, allowed me to jumpstart and help um, orchestrate the Black Student Alliance because there's nothing like it. You know, the college can do something, but it does not start unless the students, the ones that is affecting, step up to the, um, the occasion and then partake in it. Tyrell, you got to get out of my head, man. That's what's up. That's what's up. Look, so I was going to say the same thing. Community college. So that begs the question. Ask, this question makes me ask the question, who are we excluding and why? All right. So circumstances, environmental factors. Who are we excluding? What could we be doing better uh, as far as reaching out or outreach to uh, various areas of Johnston County? Um, so as the community college, uh, I think we one of the barriers is connectivity and um, how do we relate with uh, populations or groups who are traditionally underrepresented at the college level. And then we have to ask ourselves, what are we going, uh, what can we potentially do about it? Uh, because the more we are inclusive and create a sense of belonging for the entire uh, county or people who are willing to come to JCC, uh, it, 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 the bottom line, it, it increases our FTE. And, and we know FTE is directly associated with funding. And so if we are reaching out and we are allowing people to come because we have something for everybody, then everybody would come. But we have to prepare for everybody to come. So, you know, so infrastructure has to take consideration of what if we get an influx of this group of people, how are we going to serve them? These are questions and we can't be scared. We can't be afraid. We have to be brave and we have to be intentional because if we're moving forward into the future and the world is going to look different, how are we leaving ourselves out because we're afraid to make decisions that's going to benefit us in the future? And so that's where we have to start to address these things. And then our barrier is the culture of the county. Do we get resistance because people or some people in the county may not want JC, JCC to look that way? Then we have to bring those individuals to the table and have a conversation with them as well as, and ask them, so why do you feel this way? Give them an opportunity to address their concerns so we can rebut uh, with our, our vision. And so if we are able to do that, I think that we are we're going to create a sense of belonging for the entire Johnston County. And hey, Wake County might come in and say, I want to come to JCC or Wayne County, Wilson, uh, all the counties that border JCC. Uh, but we have to have vision and we have to be brave in our uh, endeavors. I love the word intentional, Joseph. Huh? I think I think I agree with you completely on that. I guess, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess I would add to what Joseph and and Dawn said about not only as the students but their staff and faculty. And so I always say that you have to let people see. Uh, they have to see something, and C stands for significant emotional event. So until people see changes that happen for the good, then it's difficult to overcome the barriers, especially when you don't have support for it. So we have to make sure that as, as Don and, and Josephine said, that the community understands where we're going, how we're going, and that we're trying to be inclusive of everybody and, and everybody be at the table. So. I'm going to throw this out there. Um, we we are 
we're we're showing that there is a specific problem. It sounds like you know there's representation and, and showing that. Do we have any answers? Like how? Like what's what's our game plan to get this to uh, to have that representation and to um, um, and to make it a have our community be more um, uh, diverse and have more uh, black faces in in our space. Like, what is there? Do we have? A, does anybody have an idea of the, any solution, proposal, that, that type of thing? I'm I'm hearing that there is a problem, and um, I wrote right here. Like, what is the answer? Like, as far as uh, you know, I'm from the community, but I am not a employee of Johnston Community College, but have some experience with the college um, through my current profession. Um, and also I have, I have a family member who did attend JCC um, before transferring. Um, one thing as far as, you know, your, your faculty and staff, who's on your hiring committees? If your hiring committee looks one way, the likelihood that a candidate that looks different than that uh, committee is going to be chosen is, is next to next to none. Um, so if your hiring committees are not diverse and, and by diverse, I don't just mean by color, um, gender, orientation, religion, whatever. Um, if they are not as diverse as possible, you're going to get group thinking. You're going to continue to hire the same person over and over and over and over again. Um, as far as students go. Um, I, I recruit for four-year um, institutions, but even in doing that, um, there is a perception, uh, of, particularly of high school students, maybe not um, adult students, there's a perception that if you attend a community college or a technical school or a junior college, that there that's some level of failure on your part, which is, which is not true. Um, we know that you know, as educators, that that's absolutely not true. Community college, you can't you can't beat the price point. You can't beat the diversity of um, uh, programs and certificates there. Um, so there has to be some sort of, uh, you know, marketed um, mar marketing uh, tactic, um, so that the community understands, you know, what you're offering. Um, then location-wise, Johnston Community College sits on the edge of two very old Black neighborhoods. Um, you know, you have Pine Acres right across the street and Belmont and Sandy Run abut the campus. How often is Johnston Community College in those three neighborhoods? Um, there's a wealth of, and, and I know if Marlon was <laughs> was on this, um, that's his uh, that's his district in Smithfield. Um, so how, how often is Johnston Community College in the neighborhood where it exists? Um, when I was in high school, I did a, uh, I was a camp counselor for a day camp and the location of the day camp was a field across the street from the main entrance of Johnston Community College. There was no representation from Johnston Community College at that day camp. Now this was 20 years ago. Um, but you know, the location of Johnston Community College is you're, you're in a diverse neighborhood. Who who are you talking to in that neighborhood? Um, you know that there's there's an opportunity there. Uh, so that's that's just what I've seen um, as you know in my profession and growing up in the um, growing up in the you know in the county um, as a kid having band concerts at the at the um, auditorium, you know, it, it wasn't at that time, it wasn't um, necessarily the most welcoming place uh, for people that look like me. So um, that there has to be a talk about um, campus culture um, and, and welcoming the, it's a community college and it should look like the community um, which is the county um, in which it resides. So let me speak to Stacy. your uh, comments regarding interview committees and so forth. So we do have 
policies and procedures that require our committees to be diverse, whether that's for part time or full time. I'll let Joseph on, um, talk about the culture that we are um, moving to at the college, the culture transformation that we're moving to the college. But uh, we are making sure that moving forward that we uh, intentionally, as, as Joseph Vaughn and Don uh, alluded to, we are being intentional about making sure that we ask those questions. You'll see things in the future that talk about what our new culture is. It'll be uh, within our recruitment materials as well as postings when we post positions. So there are changes that we have in the works uh, that will take a little time to happen, but but there are a lot of things that are on the move in terms of what we're trying to do. I'm gonna insert this question oh, here. Oh, go ahead. I just wanna add something, um, something to that as far as the answer. Um, I think the bottom line is we all need to come together. You know, and I think that's something that we need to start right away. You know, there's, there's no good in us talking about the problems. And, and it just reverts back to what I said um, previously is no, you know, no good if we talk about the problems and not act upon it. You know, and another reason why is together we are powerful together, you know. Together, iron sharpens iron. You know, the Bible talks about when two or three are gathered together. So together, we can all feed off of each other. We can all gain ideas off of each other to make the college on what we what we we perceive or what the college should be like. So I think the bottom line is we all need to come together. Um, and I think that's that's how we can get achieve that and achieve it more quickly is if we come together, other than having um just a you know a conversation about it. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's going to insert this question here. Uh, many um, many panelists have mentioned programming that can be adjusted. How might we adjust our curriculum in a way that is reflective of a cultural shift and a level of inclusion at JCC? I can repeat that again. Uh, we've mentioned programming that can be adjusted. How might we adjust our curriculum in a way that is reflective of a cultural shift and a level of inclusion at JCC? Um, given that I'm in the instructional division, I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think that that is going to take some intentional work um, and some work as a group to really, um, you know, because one of the things with instruction is that faculty do have a level of autonomy, um, especially, you know, faculty in, in higher ed. Um, so I think that will take some discussion and a common goal that we are all working towards. Um, it can't just be say it and then you you leave it to the group and everyone interpret it, interprets it the way they want and, and goes off to their classroom and executes you know, uh, in, in whatever way they, they feel like it. Um, so I do think that um, at the community college level, I'll just speak for, you know, my area that there are, that faculty disciplines work very closely together. I don't think this is an impossible task. I don't think it's impossible to put this out as a goal um, for um, our instructors um, and to see what kind of um, dynamic can be created based on uh, their conversation um, and dialogue and what they, what they can agree upon and how they can move forward and how content is presented to our students. I don't believe that at any point in time that as a whole body that they would be resistant to, to what we're trying to do if we work in an intentional way um, that um, utilizes um, academic research and, um, and, and looks at things uh, in a way that can be delivered across 
across the disciplines. So um, I think it's it's back to what Tyrell was saying that we all need to get together sometimes in the same in the same room. I think a lot of people are doing a lot of things in pockets, um, doing the best they can in their department, in their area, um, in their conversations um, with students. But I agree with him wholeheartedly that um, and Joseph on when he mentioned um, the intention behind the work and it needs to be. It needs to create an infrastructure in which we can all work and see some product from our work. I want to add to that real quick. Uh, I think that you, if we acknowledge that there's a discrepancy uh, and the curriculum needs to uh, kind of be changed, first we have to, you know, as far as decision makers go, we need to acknowledge what people are saying. And then, like Dawn said and Tyrell said, come together um, as opposed to seeing it as a problem. Like so many times, the first and the easiest thing to say is no. And that defeats morale and uh, people just decide not to even put up a put effort. Uh, but if we can come together and then do our research. And so also with individuals who may feel that we are being you know, polarizing on one end uh, for a particular group of people, then that is some, that mentality and that thinking is part of the problem. And it's the reason why we're here in 2021 still talking. Uh, so I think that more action needs to be, be done. If we are acknowledging it, let's put some action behind it. There's going to be some naysayers. There's going to be people that's going to resist. Don't let the resistant, the resistance stop the change, the necessary change from happening. And that's not being revolutionary. That's being how we're going to keep up with what's going on in the 21st century. And, you know, we don't want to lose people because of the lack of belonging. And then someone else decides to put in place in an existing or nearby community college and they're taking our students. So we want to make sure that, hey, you know, uncomf being uncomfortable or being comfortable with being uh, uncomfortable is growth. If you're in a comfort zone and you stay in your comfort zone, you're never going to grow. Until you step outside your comfort zone, you're not going to realize that you got different skill sets or create or, or learn new skill sets. You've always had and had one one mentality growing up and you've never adopted or you're uh, broadening your horizon, so to speak. Then you're not going to understand how to interact with various cultures. Uh, some of us have, are very used to interacting with various cultures because we've had to do it our entire life. So I ask people who have never had to interact with various cultures, how comfortable are you with interacting with students who may not look like you because you've never had to interact with those students your entire life? Some of us are very good at doing it and it's natural to us. Um, so I think that we have to acknowledge what affects reality everywhere. That is being aware. If you think about it, acknowledge what's affecting every student's reality on your can on our campus and then come to the table. That's the reason why we are decision makers. That's the reason why we're educators. That's the reason why we are tasked with making some hard decisions. We have to make sure that we are inclusive of all. Uh, that's, that's all I got for that one. Alongside you, know, with being aware of various cultures, you also got to stay up to date, keep up to date with what's trending in those cultures. You know, an example is back in the day, in order for you to go, let's say you wanted to travel to New York or you wanted to travel to somewhere, what would you do? You go to mapquest.com and you read the questions. Now we have GPS. And as far and when it comes with being comfortable or being learning to be comfortable with what's uncomfortable. Um, when it comes to that is you just it, it's something that you have to do as a part of growth, you know, staying up to date with what's trendy and you will find ways. And when you stay up to date, you will find ways you will say, wow, I didn't know this about this culture. I didn't know this about this person. Um, now I'm able to communicate better because in order for you to start to change, you also have to be able to relate to them. And I think, um, you know, that's something as well that you have to do is stay up to date with what's trendy. I think that's really um, for us uh, at JCC um, 
they've been, this has nothing to do with race, but just the fact that we have to have gone, have moved from teaching adult learners to now teaching ninth graders and um, because of our CCP, and that's a growing um, population for us. And, and there's been, you know, people have to move outside of their comfort zone because they're telling me, this is not why I wanted to become a community college teacher to teach a ninth grader. Um, and so I, I hear what you're saying, and you can take that beyond just the, the, the grade of the student um, to um, their ethnicity and culture and so many different things, because um, our campus is um, trying to be more diverse and trying, you know, of course, to um, open their doors up to everyone. And there are folks who have a level of discomfort with various populations. Um, whether it's veterans, law enforcement. I mean, you know, we have all different kind of faculty who are dealing with um, whomever walks in their door. And, and, and that's a challenge for them that they need to continue to stretch themselves and to use relevant and timely examples and, and content in their class so that what, they, what they're talking about resonates with the students in front of them. Okay, um, Stacy, if you will take the lead on this next question, please. Uh, what role has representation played in your understanding of opportunity and limitations? Uh, so I'm gonna give an example, cause I'm an example girl. Um, so uh, in 2017, I had the opportunity of becoming um, Miss Black North Carolina and represented the state um, as part of the Miss Black USA organization. Um, it was my greatest experience in the representation matters uh, arena. Um, you know, I was at the same event as Miss, you know, Miss America contestants and Miss USA contestants and Miss whatevers. Um, and kids would come up to me and and you know, my colleagues and say, are you really a princess? And I got to say yes. And there were three black women with locks and big afros and every shade of brown. Um, and we even had a Mr. Black North Carolina. So there was also a gentleman there. And it would be girls and boys, children, their faces just glowed because they didn't see that as a possibility for themselves. Um, to have a sash and a crown. Um, and it seems superficial, but one of the reasons why I participated with the organization because I knew representation matters mattered. Um, in the beginning, Josephine talked about being a, being a kid and doing the mock um, election. Uh, I too did that mock election. <laughs> um, I did vote for Jesse though. <laughs> but um, it seemed so far-fetched in the 80s that um, that someone that looked like us would even be president, and now it's normal. Um, you know, when Kamala Harris took her oath of office, I'm not like a crybaby, but I was in my office streaming streaming the inauguration, and I choked up and cried um, because I also still at 41 years old did not see that as a possibility, um, and now it's normal. Um, you know, now my little nieces uh, can look at TV and see a woman um, of color, you know, kind of being the boss lady and um, making a difference in, in legislation. And um, those things, those things are powerful. Um, you know, even I think about my collegiate experience um, and thinking about um, all of the women administrators who um, made a difference in my educational pursuits. Um, or when I was a child, I never saw black women being presidents of colleges and universities. And now that's that's normal. Um, so you there's a saying is that you can't be what you can't see. Um, and so if we don't see ourselves in various arenas, if we don't see, you know, black and brown or people of color as engineers, as um, 
industry leaders, as college presidents, as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, if we don't um, see other Black homeowners, we, we believe that those things aren't possible for us. Um, so when we talk about legacy, we have to, um, there has to be representation um, of us in every facet of life. Um, because then then we believe if we don't have that representation, then we believe we're limited by only what we see. You know, when I was when I was a child, nobody I knew had a passport. Nobody black I knew left the country. Um, and so uh, when I did travel outside of the country, um, I was off just off the mainland United States, still in the U.S. territory. Um, and so travelers from uh, from European countries who were vacationing in the same place that I was traveling just assumed that was the help, <laughs> you know, because that's that's what they had experienced because they had not seen us. People need to see us doing and being everything that can be done or, or you know, thought of. Um, so uh, otherwise, we as black people, brown people, people of color are trapped in the limitation of what we see. And then other people who are um, not people of color are trapped in the limitation of what they have seen, which is the absence of us in certain arenas. So let me, uh, I think I can add a little bit to this, this part of the question in that if, if, if you don't have representation then the others in the room can't understand, regardless of what culture you're speaking of. So, for example, like like Stacy said, if you don't have a black or brown person at the seat at the table, then you may not even think about it. But by having those uh, groups represented, it helps you to hopefully make a better and more informed decision. I, I can recall. Um, I moved from Greensboro, North Carolina to Los Angeles, California, as soon as I graduated from college. And it was a new experience, but it opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And then when I came back to North Carolina, you know, it, it, it opened my eyes and helped me to educate others uh, because I did have a seat at the table where I worked at the time and it helped us to grow in, in different ways. And so I think you have to continually ask yourself, you know, what is it that we're missing? What represent, what groups do we not have represented here at the table? And then you have to go seek out that. You just can't talk about it as, as others have indicated. You have to act on it. And if you act on it, you never know what the outcome may be. And then you become a leader in the community and you have to have confidence in yourself as well. Meaning that if you are at the table, have the confidence that you can speak up, that you can say what's needed to be said and not be chastised by it. I'll stop there. I think that's important what you said, Harlan, um, because you you have to be courageous sometimes when you're the only one. Um, and you have to um, be confident to use your your voice. And, and you know, sometimes that's been challenging for me. Um, when I first came to Johnson County, I had to go to a meeting um, of uh, civil engineers, retired civil engineers at a place I've never been to in the county restaurant. And then I had to go way back in this room. And, um, you know, when you walk in and everyone looks at you like that's not what they expected. Um, you know, you have those those moments um, of of fear sometimes, um, and um, you know that's when you have to dig deep and know that that this moment is important not just for you but for them and for somebody else who's going to come behind you. Um, so that the more that happens, they you won't have that moment of fear or. Um, or wondering, do I belong? You know, you have to, and I say this to my daughter all the time. She's, you know, just graduated. Um, she's in graduate school now and, you know, just getting into the world of work and, and so forth. And, um, you know, 
there there is going to be a moment for Tyrell when he stands up and represents and and he is the only one and he has to advocate for all the things that he believes in and I'm sure he might might be nervous um, because all eyes are on him and that helps us grow though those moments we have to go through because we we push through we we put the fear in its place and we find our courage um, is very important. And, and that's something that I try to talk to, you know, some students about. You can't just always turn around and say, not me. Um, sometimes it has to be you um, for yourself and for, and for others. I want to piggyback off of that uh, because I do get nervous. Um, but I will say if I did allow fear to get in the way, Right there where you see my name, Tyrell, BSA president, you wouldn't see it. Because when I when I first heard about the potential of starting up a Black Student Alliance, I was nervous. Not only because I didn't know how others would receive and be receptive of me being a Black Student Alliance in a predominantly white institution, but also personally, I've never done something where I had to be a leader or be a president or be in charge. Um, and growing up, uh, people always used to tell me, there's something in you. I see you leading people. And I never understood what they were talking about. But now I understand by me accepting that position to be the BSA president, I now understand what people were instilling in my life as I was growing up and everything is lining together. So you cannot let fear get in the way of your destiny. You can't allow fear to get in the way of your future. Just go out there. And when you go out there and you show that you're persistent, everything else will fall into place. Let me piggyback <laughs> on what Terrell just said, because I, I have an acronym for fear, Don. I know you like acronyms. So the, the, the positive part about fear is that you face everything and rise, as opposed to forget everything and, and uh, uh Right. And, and, and leave. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have to be courageous to make sure that we face everything. And instead of going down, we rise. And we have, you know, programs, the state has programs that, that the rise program itself. And so that's, you know, that's another way that I try to encourage myself in the environments that I uh, find myself in. Yeah, and I, I just want to say real quick that Tyrell is uh, never let that be any, uh, a reason why you don't try because someone may say, because they'll use it as an excuse, uh, as a reason. He's never done it before. Well, no one's never done it before until they've done it and they've received their opportunity. So keep that attitude that you got, brother. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, always remember that someone is always, someone's watching you. And a lot of times when you speak your truth, they may not be listening. They may be trying to hear what you're saying to go and say that he said or she said this to try to bring some type of uh, harm to you in a certain way. So always be uh, resolute in, in, in your uh, in your truth. And I want to uh, shout out uh, in, in regards to this question, shout out Derek Arnold, because me and Derek understood the importance and the education behind cultural enrichment. And I use my own experience. I've never been on a vacation. Some people took family vacations from the time they was children and they've seen things. So I, I, me and Derek was talking and I said, look, well, you know, some of our students never been outside of Johnson County. And so we started taking our students to places and sitting uh, and, and developing programming while we was away, having speakers come speak, HBCU visit, a PWI, predominantly white institution visit. And so the students could get away from Johnson County to see something more than what they've seen in their life so they can dream and they can see representation of people that look like them. And so it's very educational. Some would say that it's not, um, but you know, it's very educational and it's opportunities that wouldn't necessarily exist unless that they was at the community college. And that's the beautiful thing about the community college as well. We get so caught up in, you know, if you're transferring, if you're going to a four year, however, community college also is for people who are trying to get back into the workforce, non-traditional students. We're using Dallas Herring's uh, philosophy of taking someone, meeting wherever, you know, someone wherever they are to take them as far as they can go. We always have to remember our mission and why we're doing what we do. And it's a special place to be in the North Carolina Community College System because you're 
helping people realize their dreams every day. And so if you only want to focus on one particular individual, then I ask, are you living out the true purpose of the community college? Got an additional question here. Um, while representation is good, direction and engage, sorry, while representation is good, direction and engagement can have a greater impact. How does mentorship play into representation and continuation of black legacy across the board, faculty, staff, and students? I think it goes real quick to, uh, and, and I'll say this real quick. Sometimes if we are in a, a position of leadership, sometimes our decisions uh, that we make may affect or offend a group of people more than we know. So that uh, ability to be able to ask someone or someone to mentor you that you trust, that you trust is not gonna give you bad advice, uh, someone locally. And um, so they can say, look, that might not go over too well. So you might, know, you might need to rethink that decision. I think that's the importance of uh, mentorship uh, at the higher level. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the student level, I think that students get discouraged uh, because sometimes, depending on which generation you're in, you might feel like giving up uh, because things aren't happening as fast. Or are we forgetting our generation of older students who aren't as computer savvy and they're not good with technology? Are we uh, forgetting them as well? So we got to make sure that we are able to, especially at the community college, like I said, you know, mentor them, assist them and help them along the way. So we can get them, like Dawn said, in through and out. Right. In through and out. ADG. I started to put my um, agree to the grief T-shirt on today too, Dawn. <laughs> uh, I, I think that it's the key to success and we start early, you know, and I, I'll take a minute to, to speak to it starts real early. And what I mean by that, in our educational system, we have students that we send to, I used to call them gifted and talented schools. So if 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 you get sent to or, or if you chosen at, at age four, five, six at, to attend a, a gifted and talented school, and you have two kids, what does that mean to the other kid if they don't get chosen? And if you don't have a good mentor, which is, I'm speaking to my father particularly, my mother too, but I mean, my mother, you know, I, I, I won't go there because <laughs> she might be listening. <laughs> but the, the whole thing is, is that you have to have a solid mentor to make sure that you uh, understand what's going on and how it affects uh, as you move, uh, how it affects your life as you move forward. And we can't make assumptions and just leave people out there to be because we all have to listen and not only listen and hear, but we have to act on those things and make sure that our voice is heard in different ways. So the mentor to me uh, is key and critical. And we're, we're implementing or we implemented a new program at JCC that, that that does center around mentors, and we continue to try to improve on that. I um, I just want to insert this real quick, and I want to uh, hear a response from. Um, but some people want to hear a response from, from Stacy. Um, I want to insert that in just about uh, eleven minutes. Here we're going to go to uh, Q and A. Uh, we got so if, for those of you that are watching uh, that are participating from Facebook and YouTube, please submit uh, questions in the comments uh, section there. All right. yeah. I, I, I am a believer um, of uh, having mentors and, and I've always um, would seek out people to be my mentors. And I think that's something that I always tell um, either my faculty or people that I um i mentor is that you need to seek out people there it's not always that that person is going to come into your life but i'm also a believer of having i mean i have mentors who give me advice and i have accountability accountability partners who tell me the truth 
Um, and so those people are crucial for me because they keep me stable. They give me candid feedback when it, and it may not be constructive and it may not be gentle, but um, they hold me accountable um, and um, I value them tremendously. So I think sometimes you can have a combination of two. There are people who, who can mentor and, and provide support in one way. And then um, there are people that you just call your accountability partners that will give you the hard truth about um, uh, what you're doing. And that, that, you know, that might be the person you really ask, did, did I just screw this up? Or, you know, what do you think about this? And they are, um, they are gonna give you the truth. And as long as you trust them, then, then you know, they're a good partner with you. Um, for me, <clears throat> there's a, a threefold answer to that question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my doctoral research centers around African-American women um, who are in the executive arena at historically black colleges and universities and um, the role that uh, mentors, specifically male mentors play in their ascendance to the um, executive level. Um, personally, uh, I have a three level <laughs> system um, similar to Dawn's, except I have an extra level. Um, I have my tight circle who are my, my, um, my four girlfriends within higher education uh, who we're all, we're basically peers. Um, so we're all kind of progressing through um, higher education at PWIs, community colleges, com community college systems, and four-year universities together. Um, we share our struggles, we share our joys, personal, professional, um, we chop it up. Um, and, and when one has an interview, a big interview, we prepare them, um, critiquing, you know, from what you're wearing to uh, your presentation, um, everything, your resume, cover letter. Um, then then um, there are mentors and then there are champions. Your mentor is who you discuss your career trajectory with, who you discuss your next um, your next uh, career progression with. Um, those are people who are invested time, investing time and their wisdom into you. And you talk to them frequently, not as frequently as your tight circle, but you do talk to your mentors frequently. Then you have a champion. Your champion, you may rarely talk to, but that's a person, um, an OG <laughs> in your field who can pick up the phone and make a phone call and get you hired. Um, and so I have a champion or two. I have mentors and, and much like uh, Mr. Harlan, my father uh, serves as, as one of my mentors. Um, He's first black city councilman in Selma, North Carolina since reconstruction, but also was a uh, higher education administrator for 39 and a half years. And he has to a degree guided my career as a mentor. Um, and somewhat as a champion at times, um, you know, and then I have other other women, higher education administration leaders who are active and retired who mentor me as well. And then I have my tight circle who I talk to nearly every day. Um, those those individuals are integral and important. And we are talking about students. Um, I mentor students. I champion students. Um, and I tell them the absolute truth. Um, I have one mentee here um, in South Carolina that I kind of inherited from someone else uh, who I'm in, immensely proud of. Um, she had a number of struggles um, and has been able to overcome. And, and that involved daily conversation, sometimes twice daily conversation. I really believe in, I also believe in peer mentorship um, amongst students, amongst faculty and staff. Um, we can help each other overcome, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be someone we consider high up or high achieving. It can be the person in the next cubicle um, next to you in the same office doing the same thing. As long as you have a um, a similar mindset, and you can you can you can share those things. And again, as as um, Miss Dixon said, uh, as long as you trust those people, um, the trust is very important. You know, Ma, we're going to get to this one last question before Q&A. Um, and 
we have about five minutes so let's uh, uh keep that in mind to uh give us some give us as much time as possible with q a from our audience um this question i want to um ask um to, i want to ask tyrell this question first um do you feel obligated to live up to the standards set by prominent black leaders of the past do i feel obligated to live up to the standards set by prominent black leaders of the past um i will say yes i do um the whole idea the whole the main basis and the theme of this conversation is defining legacy so those prominent black leaders they left a legacy they paved the way for us to be able to live the way we are living now um and it is no good in you there being a legacy if you don't continue that legacy so in a sense i do feel obligated another area of it is if i also feel as though if i don't do it who will um so that's why i tend to step up and get out of my comfort zone and i touched on it you know when we were discussing fear um but that's why i tend to step up and override my fear because at the end everything works out um so I do feel obligated that I have to set those standards based off of the fact that if I don't do it, who will? And also on a personal level, um, personally, I do believe that and spiritually, we all have a purpose. So I feel that my purpose is to make change because I do believe that I'm a natural leader. It took me some time for me to believe that, but I honestly do believe that my purpose is to lead. And in order for me to do that is to step up and to rise to the occasion. Um, and, and it just goes to anybody. We should all feel obligated. We should all feel, we should all want to continue the legacy of African-American culture because it's who we are. You know, we should all, this is something that we should strive to do, not on a, a bi-weekly or a quarterly basis, but every day. And that's something that I try to do when I come in contact with different individuals that will be of different races or different ethnicities. I try to uphold and represent the African-American culture to the best of my ability. So I think, you know, the bottom line is, and I don't know if that's an, uh, a topic or a subtopic of, for this um, conversation, but don't let fear get in the way. So that's to anyone that's watching in the comments. Don't let fear get in the way. Start the change now. Start doing things actively in your community. Figure out ways how you can get involved. And you don't have to be on the front line where you can be behind the scenes doing some things. Because I, in my in our organization, we have a lot of uh, a few individuals behind the scenes that are doing great work. You don't see them, but they're working. So find what's best for you and get out there and start making change now. We have two minutes. Short answer, I, I, you know, he said it all. Absolutely. We, uh, I mean, we can't sell the next generation short because we go lacking. And then they look at us as an example. And then they start selling their, uh, the ones coming behind them short. So short answer, yes. Any more short answers? My, my short answer, um, a lot of people like to say, I am not my ancestors these days. I, I say I absolutely am my ancestors. I am more than they ever could have thought of and dreamed of. So yes, I feel obligated to, to live up to their standards and exceed their expectations. Absolutely. Mr. Fry. Oh, I, I mean, everybody's already said it. I, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I, uh, Stacy mentioned about her, uh, thinking that her father, you know, my father was the first black elected to the general assembly since reconstruction in 1968. A lot of people don't know that he lost in 1966, but he didn't let that stop him from running again and then again in 83 uh he was named to the associate i mean the supreme court of north carolina at the same time my mother um has done a lot of things in terms of the ywca uh where she was on the national board and she's on several boards or has been on several boards um uh across the state and the country 
And so it's 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 just a, a you know like we said earlier that you have to set examples for people to follow and leave your legacy. And I, I'm an athletic person, so I've coached basketball. And I always said that you all, the young generation, is extremely important to my future because you'll be voting, Tyrell, on what, you know, what things happen and what's successful to me when I get to be 88 and 89 like my mom and dad are right now. So uh, I'm glad we're having this conversation. And another thing, I just want to say something, even on behalf of the students, um, reach out. You know, we got great panelists here, great faculty members here at the college, Mr. Jones, Mr. Fry, Mr. Dean, and Ms. Don, and also people behind the scenes, Mr. Arnold, um, Mr. Hudson, and a few others that help orchestrate this event. Reach out to them. I'm sure that they will be willing to help you um, because, I mean, that's all we can do. We, can, we, ha we have to help each other. Um, and you know, I, I'm a, I can be a, a point of contact as well. Um, if you you know have any questions, um, I also would like more student involvement, you know, on the campus as well. So you know, if you have any questions, or anything, you can reach out to me as well. All right, thank you, panelists. Uh, we have a couple questions uh, from the audience here. Uh, let's start with. Um, uh, Carrie here, who says, have you considered a peer mentoring program? Link up a JCC student with a with high school students. I think that's a great idea. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> um, I think we, um, you know, we actually had a and this is very specific to students who are interested, but we, we hosted a high school robotics team, um, which grew very big to, you know, and so that was a great um, way for us to recruit through the high schools to um, invite students in and connect them with the um, older students who were um, current community college um, students. So that was very specific. Um, to students in engineering who served as mentors to the high school um, students who are on our robotics team. But I think it was well received and certainly can scale up so that, um, you know, we're able to do this maybe with other clubs and organizations that have community uh, college students as members to then, um, because a lot of them are either discipline specific or degree specific. Um, and so uh, I think that's an idea that they could connect with high schools that have students interested in those degrees or, um, or subjects. I, th I think, Carrie, that's a, a great point as well. Uh, as Harlan mentioned before, JCC is going through a cultural transformation where we uh, have uh, broken a group up into three commissions, uh, one being community impact. So I think that the fact that our impact on the community would be uh, that would fall in line in line with that having uh, a JCC student uh, work with a student from each of the uh, eight public high schools in Johnson County. I believe it's eight, and um, we also have two other commissions. Just to throw it out there, we do uh, we are doing a, a commission that talks about JCC's uh, partner experience. So staff, faculty, students. Our, our partners, as well as uh, messaging and branding and how we get that information out as, uh, about what we're doing. So we're gonna be doing a lot of things uh, that's gonna be shaping the new the culture transformation at Johnson Community College uh, in the future. So that is definitely uh, something that we um, could possibly uh, implement and, and uh, discuss in the future. Okay, we got another question here. So, this question is from Heather. How do we engage others in being a part of legacy, in being a part of the change and not just a bystander? How do we inspire others to participate? First, we got to create a, a trusting environment. People aren't going to participate if they fear that their job is on the line. 
if they fear that there's going to be repercussions for them speaking the truth. If we uh, ensure people that you can actually uh, be a part of it without being ostracized, blackballed, uh, then, then we'll get more participation. And then we have to create an environment that is conducive to that, that allows that. Um, and um, that, that's the part of the legacy. Now, people say change is, isn't easy. So one thing that we have to understand is that this isn't going to be something that happens overnight. Uh, the change that we look for, uh, the inclusion, the belonging, uh, the culture, it's, it's going to be a consistent, intentional practice on behalf of everybody at the institution so that when we leave the institution, it can be obvious that whoever comes in and takes our place, that this is the culture. Because like I said, it takes time. And uh, so we have to create a, an environment of trust. Now that goes for external partners as well as internal partners at the college, students as well in inside of or, in, in departments. If you can trust that uh, your, 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 your supervisor isn't going to hold anything against you in meetings after they after you have a meeting, then the meeting after the meeting occurs and whatever you discuss is now changed, that decreases trust and also um, morale. So we gotta be careful uh, uh, about how we are um, treating people who are wanting to be a part of the solution. And so many people are quiet because they fear that if they speak and this isn't black, isn't just black people. This is people of all uh, uh, ethnicities, and races, uh, genders at the college. Um, at, because I have personally talked with people that aren't all, and all of them aren't black. They fear that if they speak up, then they'll be out, and that's not, uh, you know, a comfortable place to be in. I guess I would add to that is that, that we are an educational institution. So the, the other thing that I'd add is that we need to educate not just students, but staff, faculty, and the community. And I think that the, the way we involve others is through uh, different programs and things that we're trying to do, including the mentor program, because uh, as Don and others have alluded to, it, you, you think about the, 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 the people or that you spend the most time around, you're more comfortable with them. You usually trust them better. And so we have to get to that point of, of everybody trusting each other. And I think that we can move uh, to, to where we are all cohesive and moving in the same direction, um, the, 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 the positive direction. I think that we also need to make space for new, for new folks. Sometimes we get in these um, groups of doers and, um, and workers and, and others may feel like there's not space for them. Um, and, and sometimes they come in and maybe they feel like they are not, there's not space for them to, to talk. So sometimes we have to be quiet. We have to try to engage someone and just listen to, um, to what they're saying. Cause I, I think there are people who always maybe feel intimidated by just um, the, the process, the meeting, the group, they're overwhelmed um, and, and maybe a little scared. Um, but those are the people that we need to actively reach out to. And maybe it's first just a one-on-one -on -one conversation to help them feel comfortable and to bring them into um, the larger conversation. But I definitely know people, you know, I'm a talker, right? If that, that's not, you know, necessarily something that um, I would feel intimidated by, but I know others who feel like uh, the, the, the topic itself is already, can be challenging. And so to come into a room, they feel um, that that's overwhelming. And so they just simply don't participate. And so some, some of the, um, we need to do some socialization with some people one-on-one um, -on -one before we try to to bring um, them into a larger group because sometimes they get overshadowed and they get intimidated and they'll never come back. They'll just, it, it, it might be too much for them. So I think that, that there's some strategies that we can use to engage a larger population who are kind of on the fringe, just looking, but, you know, not necessarily 
um, dipping their toe in. To piggyback off of that, um, I think recruitment. Go out there and recruit individuals. Go out there and, and treat it as if it was a business. If you had a business or your daughter had a business or your son had a business, you would want to let the whole world know what they're doing. So do the same thing when you go out to recruit others and engage others in legacy. And if they choose not to participate, ask questions. You don't know unless you ask because the same reason why they won't participate may be the same reason why 500 people won't participate. So ask questions and figure out and strategize on how you can overcome that so that way you can gain the participation. And, and if let's say you don't get the engagement, you do what you do to the best of your ability because best believe they're watching you. And if you know a person of color or one of us, they're, they're really watching you. But it's a good thing if you're doing the right thing. So uphold what you are trying to portray out there and others and, 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 and engagement will come. But you have to start. I think one, one thing um, that um, hasn't been said yet is other than other than change is really uncomfortable, but um, letting people know that engaging in conversations about change is not about guilt. Uh, having uncomfortable conversations, if we're specifically referring to cultural change um, at an institution that's you know fairly established and entrenched in the community, um, the conversations are will be uncomfortable. Uh, because you will have to discover that some of your long-held uh, values are not as true as you may have thought they were. Um, and that is not to inspire a um, sense of guilt. It's to inspire a sense of uh, inquiring further, um, a sense of wow, that's a, new, that's a new thing. That's a new way of looking at life that I was not aware of. It's challenging what I knew life to be and that hurts and that's uncomfortable, but I should not feel guilty about that. Um, I have to deal with my discomfort. I have to deal with my hurt that my long held beliefs and values and whatever, um, may need to change and I may need to interrogate those belief systems and those values further. Um, and so beginning conversations that way about cultural change um, and, and that's change systems in, in general. Um, uh, you know, you have to let people know that, that you know, yes, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be challenging what you have long held to be true, but that is not to inspire a sense of guilt. It's to inspire a sense of true interrogation of um, what what culture is and where it should go. Yeah, reflection and discovery. And um, and some may stay away because they feel like it is going to be like a blame game and finger pointing and you are, you know, bad and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. So, it, I mean, it's it's none of us are sitting up here acting like this is something that's fixed with a statement. And, and I mean, th these are <laughs> these are difficult conversations. This is a long journey. It's a long journey. I'm not saying it's not important to have a first step, but I'm I'm saying this is this is a lot of pain and hurt and currents that are running through you know this entire um, institution that sometimes we are tiptoeing around um, when we really need to you know dive in and and have a real candid conversation um, and that makes people scared. People feel vulnerable. People feel, you know, um, that that uh, guilty um, about what they believe, um, and they don't know how to juggle all of those emotions. So um, I think this is a start. I think is, you know, 
wonderful that we can um, have these open conversations. But if it's not true transparency, if you know, if you're not willing to, you know, have a, a AA moment and stand up and say, "I am this," then the healing can't begin. It can't. And other, and if we don't really do that, all we're doing is shuffling things around and trying to pretend that that's the fix that that's going to fix everything. Um, and it, it is going to be a very difficult um, process to to really turn this this corner. But I think there there are things that um, there's a willingness, which is always you know um, a starting point. Um, and we all have to be courageous. We all have to be courageous because everything we hear and everything we say not gonna land on you know everybody the same way that's 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 beautiful right there what she just said just you know the whole you know the fact that if you can't express yourself without fear then then you're creating more resentment in a group of people uh if the truth of a group of people so i i got this quote that says we can can't afford to discount a person's pain to soothe another's pleasure, uh, excuse me, to soothe another's discomfort. And so when we speak and talk about the truth, not talking about the pain, and that's looked at as being polarizing, you're going to lose people, that's resentment being built. When all we want to do is have a conversation, we, we just want acknowledgement and understanding and, and the ability to express without uh, being um like I said, being blackballed or or stereotyped as being someone who is going to create uh, dissension in the organization. And until we can get to a point where we listen, when someone speaks pain or they express themselves, like for instance, like if we expressing ourselves because we feel what you don't feel, we see what you don't see and we're trying to express it to a point where we can articulate it so you understand it and it's still met with, I mean, you know, I'm uncomfortable. You need to be quiet. You just put your head down and that's how our ancestors were treated. And so we learned those lessons and we have courage through the years, but we, like Dawn said, we're not only, everyone has to be courageous in, in the attempt. And uh, so we need to stop saying that you know, someone who speaks their truth is, is 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 polarizing, and we need to listen as opposed to going and trying to make statements about someone and um, get them in trouble. And, and we need to be accepting, because I, I think you know a lot of times, having worked a long time, my struggle is this constant need to label me and put me in the box of how I should be as an African American woman. When my experience is everyone since I was a little girl told me I was a powerful, entitled, um, confident, brilliant, beautiful black woman. And, and then I feel like I go into a work environment and they try to convince me that I'm not that. Um, and that goes against every everything that I know and believe about myself and that I need to be labeled and told how to behave. Um, which is challenging for me. And I, and I, I think organizations sometimes decide how you should be and act and put you in a little box. And that is the expectation of the, of the, um, of the organization. And I, I think if we can't feel accepted and for who we truly are, um, if you want a diverse population, if you want a diverse workforce, they're all not going to look and behave the same. They are all not going to talk the same. They are all right. not going to respond to things the same. And that's okay if that's what you truly want to embrace. And not just a bunch of colors, but you know, the colors come with real people with real behaviors. Um, and and that 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 may feel different. Right. And the, and the burden of walking around, not being able to express yourself because you're passionate about something and not being labeled as the angry black man or the angry black woman in the organization who creates trouble and starts trouble. That's a burden, a constant burden, because you have to dumb yourself down because you know that you've been told that you're great. 
You've been told your entire life that you are different, that you're special. And then you, what you've experienced externally doesn't match the way you feel when you go into the organization and you have to fit a culture that is just not conducive or it doesn't feel or align with who you know you are. And uh, so you have to be really careful because being labeled as the angry black man, the troublemaker or the angry black woman is real. And so some of those things don't ever, they're never talked about or discussed in, in, in our presence, but in the com in the conversations after the meeting, the meeting before the meeting or after the meeting, what is really being said? Um, so being told to calm down or chill by someone because you're showing passion isn't 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 what it is. It's it's not a good thing, and it doesn't feel good. So, um, I want to I'm gonna I'm gonna have a a, a piggyback question on that. Um, let's see. Let's see. Do you recognize diversity, equity, and inclusion as a core value of JCC? Why or why not? Are we talking present, past, future? I think I'll let you like decide on that. Like. I think JCC is moving towards um, this as a core value with the recent uh, formation of our CDEB uh, committee that is focusing on the cultural transformation. Um, and so in order for this to be a core value, diversity, equity, and inclusion has to be a part of every part of the campus, decision-making, policies and procedures, hiring practices, and how we discipline staff, faculty, and students with consideration to are we really uh, having due process or we are um, having a committee of like-minded individuals making a decision on someone that we may not really understand. So we have to be very, very careful in our uh, practices because we have to consider our brand. Everything that we do is a representation of Johnson Community College from the community standpoint, which if you've ever, I never knew Johnson Community, Johnson County or Smithfield had a sign. So uh, welcome to Smithfield, home of the Ku Klux Klan, something like that, until I started working at JCC and I went to college in Raleigh and I drove through Johnson County from college just, but someone pulled me to the side and the first week I was at JCC and told me to be careful. So that's the brand that Smithfield presented itself, presented to the rest of the, the state. So what is the brand that JCC is presenting by our practices? And how do we want other people to perceive us? That is how we are going to continue to have diversity, equity, inclusion as a core value. The thing is, this isn't gonna be easy like dawn said because there's so many undercurrents like she said that are resistant to that because when you think about diversity people probably automatically think about losing their jobs and like i said earlier they only got that position because they're black and um and i know we almost done and i want to yeah, like, give it to anyone else I'm, yeah i picked yeah. up your cue brother all right I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right there well i just want to quickly say that values to me is how you behave who do you hire? Who do you promote? Who do you let go? It's about behaviors. It's, it's about everyone deciding this is how we behave individually and then how that, what kind of pattern of behavior does this institution have? Because people have nice value statements. Enron had a nice value statement. And what did it do? It's about how you behave and treat your employees. So if I was a well, Dawn, if you were a preacher, I'd say amen. But so, so, and, and she spoke directly to what I was thinking about is we have to live and breathe what we say we are in everything that we do, every day, every hour, 
every week, and we have to check ourselves. You know, back, back, and I'm going to say this is a cultural thing. Back in the day when I was growing up, you would get whipped by anybody in the neighborhood. If you acted up in somebody else's house, you got whipped. <laughs> now, kids now, Terrell, we, you know, people got spanked by somebody else's parents. Now, you call the police and say child abuse. <laughs> but I'm just saying we have to live, we have to breathe, and we have to do what we say we are in order for things to stick and stay and to create that culture that you want. We admit that we're not where we want to be, but we have to get, you know, you have to decide where you are and where you want to be and then act like it and do it. I want to uh, throw in just one more, try to get one more question here. We only got about five minutes, so let's try to keep our, it's difficult. We're having a good conversation, so it's difficult to keep these answers uh, short. And I appreciate that. Um, but, um, Let's try to get uh, Stacy and Tyrell in here at some with this question. Um, what roles do intracultural teamwork and intracultural collaboration play in continuing Black legacy? So I think, um, you know, tying history into the present, uh, there's never been a time when um, African American people or African peoples, people in the diaspora worldwide have made any sort of strides and uh, without um, intracultural teamwork um, or, or collaboration. Uh, so present day wouldn't be any different. Um, so the role of, of teamwork and collaboration um, one, uh, when you're speaking about Black people, Black Americans in particular, um, our voices have been silenced and muted um, in the country since our arrival here. Um, and so it's important for cultures outside of ours um, to be more readily, uh, to be more ready to listen um, over telling us what to do or how to feel or how to be or how to express or how to dress or how to look. Um, so part of that collaboration and teamwork is a willingness to listen and to um, approach that teamwork or collaboration with humility that I don't know what their experience is like even if I have black friends, even if I have black family members, even if I have a black spouse, even if I have biracial children, I do not know what that experience is like to walk around in that skin, to automatically be assumed that you're, you're doing something or you're somewhere that you shouldn't be. So uh, approaching, approaching that, um, those conversations and that organizational change from a position of humility and I don't know what that experience is like. So let me listen and let me use my influence to help elevate and amplify um, that voice so that change can occur. Um, quick answers. We have two minutes and I'm going to try to wrap up. That was an excellent response there. All right, so we have one minute remaining here. I just want to, excellent, excellent panel here. I really appreciate um, our panelists. Thank you so much for taking the, uh, on behalf of the Black History Committee, I just wanna um, thank everybody for uh, joining us today. Thank, thank you to uh, social media out there, everybody in our audience for being a part of this, something special for us that we, have always wanted to talk about, and we it's it, we it's very difficult 
to talk about these things. And that's why this is a courageous conversation. And hopefully uh, we've all uh, received something from this. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for uh, participating with us. And um, I just want to say good night and um, have a good rest of your, uh, your evening. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.